You know, I, I just talk, talked to the Episcopal clergy of the state here uh, last Friday, and um, I was trying to explain some of the same material. And my what I told them, I can't prove this. I just have a strong intuition that the word contemplation emerged already in the desert period, you know, because the word prayer had become so trivialized and cheapened by misuse. Mm -hmm. And we needed another word. That prayer had already become, you know, among many, this functional, pragmatic, telling God things, asking God for things, more and more limited to intercessory prayer, as we'd call it. But not this change of consciousness, not this this different pair of eyes. You, know, yeah. you could pray within your dualistic mind. You could pray within your normal, unconverted self. It didn't match conversion to prayer. Mm -hmm. You didn't understand? Yeah. Yeah. So the unconverted self could really, and don't we all know this in mainline Christianity, really use God. There was no love affair with God. Mm -hmm. It was just. Well, this is the one who has all the power. We better get on his good side. And when we want things, we, we know who to go to. It was all the big daddy in the sky stuff. So contemplation became that word, admittedly, used in different ways by different people. But a subset, uh, more preferred in monastic settings and uh, poetic, maybe poetically minded Christians who were are more mystically minded Christians who, who needed a word to say, I'm not just talking about saying prayers or recited prayers or formulaic prayers. You know? So you probably heard me say, I, I'm convinced it is a different mind. It's, and and I, I, the main way I can try to teach it is to put it in contradistinction to the antagonistic, problematic, calculating uh, uh, mind which we largely operate of, out of, more, the more so we're educated, even more so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you've, uh, it's a major conversion for most Western people at this point in history. And uh, it, it seems that it largely got lost, except for the word, even in uh, the Catholic contemplative orders. Uh, pretty much after the Reformation and the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. It's just we, the contemplative, and it was Thomas Merton who pretty much revealed that. I always say he pulled back the veil mm -hmm. and told his own community in Kentucky, you're not contemplatives. You, some of you are, but by accident. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and many people do get there by accident, but not by systematic teaching for really, I would say, the last 500 years. Mm -hmm. Now, the whole thing's blown open in the last 30, 40 years. Yes. Where now we're rediscovering that there is a different mind that you have to practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to learn how to go there, mm -hmm. how to look out from a different pair of eyes than the problem-solving oppositional mind, mm -hmm. you know, the analytical mind. You know? And, uh, you know, when I wrote The Naked Now, where I first really tried to communicate this, I expected I'd really get a lot of pushback. I haven't. Mm. I haven't. Uh, quite the contrary, you know. Yeah. People just, if they give read it, which apparently a lot of people must, with some kind of open heart and mind, they see the truth of it. You mm -hmm. know, <laughs> it's just you know this is just sort of obvious. Yeah. And and the reason I think so much of Christianity has become so infantile and. And it does appear to be when you see racism and classism and love of war at the highest levels of people who call themselves Christian. You just know that they don't have the proper software, <laughs> yeah. I can call, to understand the Sermon on the Mount or the, the Gospels or, mm. yeah, or to know how to pray, really.